it is so liberating to know that half of all films written before 1925 were written by women. Oftentimes, half the directors were women at Universal. Half the writers at MGM were women. The power of these women behind the camera was so incredible back in the 20s and 30s. Carrie Beecham is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and author of six books. In her book, Without Lying Down, now nearing its 20th anniversary of publication, she rescues from the footnotes of history Frances Marion, who reigned as Hollywood's highest paid screenwriter for two decades. How did you come across the story of Frances Marion, and how did you know it was a story that needed to be told? I've always been a credit reader, I mean, since I was a little kid. I remember discovering that the producer of Perry Mason was a woman named Gail Patrick Jackson. And I got so excited, I was like eight years old, you know, a girl could do this, a woman can do this. And I saw Frances's name on films such as Dinner at Eight, The Champ, The Big House, as well as the name of Adela Roger St. John's and Anita Luce and Bess Meredith. And I was looking around for, to find out information about her and there was nothing. I determined that I wanted to write a book about maybe half a dozen of these women writers because clearly something had been up in Hollywood in the 20s and 30s that allowed these women to percolate to the top. Very quickly, Frances just emerged as, well, as Adela said, she was the senior all of us sophomores wanted to be. I mean, she's still the only woman to win two Academy Awards for original screenwriting. She wrote over 200 films. From 1915 to 1935, she was the highest paid screenwriter, male or female. I think it is so important to know that these women were incredibly powerful, that they formed this great community of friendship, and they stayed friends their whole lives. How is friendship important to their success? The joy of Frances, Mary, and Mary Pickford together is that here is Frances, the highest paid screenwriter, and Mary Pickford, one of the highest paid actresses, and they've teamed up. And one's behind the camera, and one's in front of the camera. There were a series of a dozen films that the two of them made together and just into a huge success. There's The Little Princess, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, Poor Little Rich Girl. Their confidence in each other and themselves was very strong. It's one of those instances where one and one makes three. It was the producer, Linda Opes, who said that I excavated history to find the story. I tell you, I can look at a paragraph in that book and realize I had to go five places to get the information that's in that paragraph. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. You know, you do a little bit of the clouds, you do a little flowers, you do a little of this, and gradually it all comes together. Can you tell us a little bit about producing the documentary and bringing different people on board? It was made for Turner Classic Movies, and they agreed to put up half the money, but we had to find um, several hundred thousand dollars elsewhere. And lo and behold, that came from Hugh Hefner. And if you ever want to hear an audience laugh, because I didn't really notice it until I was screening at the BFI on the big screen in London, and it says, Hugh Hefner presents without lying down. But God love him, he asked, I think, half a dozen questions. I answered them all. He said, fine, here's the money. So, you know, it was the easiest producing um, gig I've ever been able to get. Then, of course, it was a joy for me to bring together the women that I loved, and so many of them are no longer with us, and I miss them so much. Faye Kanan, who was president of the Academy um, and fought for women in films for so long. Mary Lee Bandy, who was the head of the film department at Museum of Modern Art in New York. When the book came out, my phone rings, and it's Mary Lee saying, I have been waiting for this book. And I said, well, great, why? She goes, because I've been waiting for a reason to curate a full set of films written by women. And MoMA put on over 40 films written by women. To 
be able to be a part of the catalyst to get that out to these new audiences was just a thrill. Hollywood has become so corporate. Often the studio is just a minor part of this larger corporation. So that makes it all the more important to speak to the question of profit. So one of our frustrations, I think, has to be when films like The First Wives Club is a huge hit, but it's viewed as a fluke. And Adam Sandler has a miserable um, box office. Well, that's viewed as a fluke. The Heat with Sandra Bullock and, and Melissa McCarthy, huge financial hit. And yet, well, I don't know, could that really ever be duplicated? There is this idea that Every movie has to be made for, you know, 14 to 20 year old males. And obviously they don't. When you study the silent era, Variety started covering movies in 1906 because they started noticing these little films that were shown on the vaudeville stage to clear out the audiences. But these little 10 minute vignettes, you know, became two hour lush epics. And I think we're going through a similar period now in terms of the changes are happening so fast. I think it bodes well for the possibility of uh, broader stories, more content, greater diversity in the content. So if you can kind of not be depressed, it's a very exciting time. <laughs> All these things were faced by these other women before, way before us. And I mean, I find knowing you're a link in a chain um, to be incredibly energizing and freeing. As, as Martha Coolidge says in the film, I went to NYU film school and I'm a graduate. And why did I never know about these things? Why did I never know about these women? After the documentary was shown at the Writers Guild Theater, I believe in Beverly Hills, a woman came up just kind of went through the people I was talking to, just came up, gave me a big hug. Never seen her before, never seen her since. And she just pulled back and said, I just want you to know I'm a writer and I'm never going to feel alone again. <laughs>